If you would, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. And uh, we, this morning, will be looking at verse 14 through 20. And before we read that, I think it's important to kind of back up a little bit to get the context. Uh, We remember that as Mark is writing this gospel, he's writing it to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. As we read later in chapter 6, we find the, uh, the apostles, and, and specifically Peter, asked the question by Jesus, who do you think I am? Who am I? And as we continue to go through this book, we're all going to ask that same question. I'm encouraging you to ask that question. Even if you think you know who Jesus is, continue to ask yourself each time you go to the Word of God, whether it's listening in a sermon like this morning or any time you're in the Word of God, continue to ask, who do I think Jesus is? I think what you'll find is oftentimes you have come to your own presuppositions. You've decided your own conclusions of who Jesus is. This often clouded by the way that we look at the world and maybe some things that you have been taught. But as we have read, as we've studied so far in this book up to verse 14, we have seen that Jesus was proclaimed. We see all the way through the Old Testament the promises of Jesus and Jesus' coming. His establishment of a kingdom was prophesied by Isaiah and others. We see that that John the Baptist came as the prophesied Elijah who would come and proclaim, make way the way of the Lord. We also see that after that, that Jesus was led into the temple, after he was installed, remember that picture, a beautiful picture of Jesus' Uh, ordination, his installation into his earthly ministry, where we see that not only was he baptized, we saw the Holy Spirit come down as a dove, and we see the Father speak out to to those who were there as well as to us, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And shortly after he was installed in this new position, ordained into this new position, he was sent out by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And we realize that he withstood that temptation. And now that he has come out and completed that initial temptation, remembering that Jesus was faced temptation throughout his earthly ministry, we come to verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, This is the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a little bit further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. That ends the reading of God's Word. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, we once again are grateful for your Word. Uh, We so often take it for granted, and we recognize that, but we thank you that we can come and we can worship you this morning. And Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone in this journey of life. You've not left us alone when when we face trials and difficulties. You haven't left us alone when we fear fear the future. We're We're uncertain to what may come around the corner. And the truth is, Father, we know that you'll never leave us or forsake us, but we also remember, Father, that you've given us your word. And as David said, it's a light to our paths. So, Father, as we come and we look at your word this morning, even this simple account, we pray that you would light up our path. Show us how we should live. Lead us, Father, even as we're here. Give us understanding. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, make your word come alive in our hearts. And Father, I pray for all who are listening to this message. I pray that your spirit would go into their own hearts. Take away the distractions. Give them ears to hear. Give them hearts and attitudes to receive so that you may be honored and glorified. Father, I'm also aware of my own weaknesses, my own sins, my own inadequacies. But Father, I ask that despite it all, that you would speak through me. May your Holy Spirit, Father, use my words for your glory and for your honor and for the transformation of our hearts and our lives. Keep me from saying anything I should not say. And may you receive the glory and the honor. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 
in this account, as we see it begins out, the John, Jesus' ministry actually didn't start officially until John the Baptist was imprisoned. Uh, we, we know that side story. John the Baptist uh, basically said the wrong thing to about Pharaoh and the woman he was living with and ended up getting thrown in prison. So once he was in prison, we see that, again, this was the time. The time was fulfilled for Jesus to step out on his, in his ministry. And John makes that clear. And notice what we see as we go into verse 14, the good news of God. And what is that good news? Notice the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, as Mark presents it, that's the message that, that Mark opens with. Jesus, the one who proclaimed, the one who's going to bring good news. And the good news is a, is a message of the kingdom, a message of repentance, a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news is that the kingdom is at hand. This was the good news that Isaiah prophesied about. This was the good news that, that John the Baptist was preparing the way for. But so often we go, and in, in Christian communities, there's a lot of confusion about what's the kingdom of God. There are a lot of believers who would argue that the kingdom of God is yet to come. It's still something that's in advance, and so we're looking forward to that day. There's different views on that and different times of what it falls out, but what we see here going straight to the Bible is recognizing that Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is at hand, and we're going to see this time and time again as we go through the book of Mark. This beautiful picture as Jesus comes and begins his ministry, it's actually the inauguration, the beginning of the kingdom. See, the kingdom of God overall describes the activity. It's an activity. It's an activity of God where God's reign and his people, where he reigns over his people in the world. He always has, but he continues to rule, and his reign continues to expand and grow wherever people come to faith in Jesus Christ. See, God has ordained that his kingdom will come to earth through his people. It's important to understand that in the very beginning of the Bible, this is not a new concept. In the beginning, if we go all the way back to Adam and Eve, we're told they were told to extend the borders of Eden. They were told again in, in Genesis 1.28 to be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it, subdue it. See, God's plan again was one to expand. His kingdom would come and it, it would expand between, beyond the Garden of Eden. From the very beginning, it was the reign of God and the expansion of his kingdom. Of course, we know that Adam and Eve sinned and they fell, didn't we? In the end of that plan, they failed that call of God. We also see as we go through Scripture that the people of Israel were also called to spread the blessing of God to the ends of the earth. Initially started with Abraham in 12 verse, Genesis 12, verse 3. But we also recognize that Israel failed in that totally and utterly. And so by the time we come to, again, Jesus comes, he comes to establish a kingdom that will not fail. But he comes precisely because of the failures of all who had gone before. The failures of you and I as we are here this morning. We realize that we can't do what God has called us to do without the help of Jesus. You see, he came, as we've already seen in previous weeks, he came as the second Adam. It's like a start over, a beginning to say, here's the second Adam. I'm going to come and I'm establishing the kingdom. Jesus is establishing the kingdom and he will, extend, he will establish and grow the kingdom. Because he is without sin. And as Paul says on more than one occasion, he's the second Adam who would fulfill all righteously. He came to do what was originally designed by God and we failed to do. So Jesus knew the high calling that he had and he came and he called others to do, come alongside him. And that's where we begin to see. You see, Jesus' words mean the time had come. Notice what he says there. It's at hand. God's reign is beginning to be seen. He's establishing it. His coming sets in motion all that has been promised. It's a, it becomes an actualization. It's, it's, it's a reality through the coming of Jesus Christ. How? It starts through Jesus himself. God has been publicly installed. He is the Son of God. He is the King, and he rules over the kingdom. And as he begins his ministry, he begins not only the establishment of that kingdom, but the advancement of that kingdom. From this point on, Sinclair Ferguson says, from now on, Jesus would speak and act publicly with authority and majesty because he is the king. 
Yes, he's our Savior, but he is the king, and he came to establish that kingdom. But as we recognize that, we, 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 with that understanding, we realize that Jesus' words are, and we're, we recognize these, and they stand out as repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus' message of the gospel demands a response. And the first response is that of repentance. Lives must change. There can no longer be indifference. When Jesus comes, it's not like there's an indifference. It's not like he's talking to no one. We must respond to the king. The the disciples had to respond to the king. Indifference is rejection. And we see loyalty to the king must be adhered to. It must be done And first we see that word repent, turn from your sinful lifestyle, live in fear of God, recognizing who God is. What we face today is is so similar to what the world faced then, is a failure to recognize the fullness and the completeness of who God is. As I started out the service, when we ask what's God's, what's, what's your favorite attribute, there are so many attributes of God, and even the attributes of God that we describe are don't even come close to a full description of who He is. But I do know that all of us, every human being who's walked this earth, takes so much about God for granted. We create an image in our own eyes. And oftentimes the images that we create in our own eyes of who God is, is one that weakens Him and moves us away from repentance. And moves us in a way that so often He just becomes our benevolent Father, as as you've heard me say before, our sugar daddy in heaven, who who just should give us what we want. But see, what He's calling And what he called that original audience to is an abandonment of a self-centered way of life and a call to be part of this royal calling to participate in this kingdom that's being built and established. But we realize that repentance is the first part. The second is believe. True repentance can't stand on its own and must be accompanied by faith. You can't just repent of something and not move on to the belief. And when Jesus calls us to that kingdom, he's asking us, again, it, we must believe. It is only through the receiving the good news of the king, recognizing it, repenting of our own sinfulness, and embracing his forgiveness and his grace in our life that we receive through the work of the Holy Spirit, a new power within us that enables us to do what we could not do before. And that's really good news. That's what we're believing in. We're not, we're not simply believing in new life. We're not simply believing in forgiveness of sins. Those are all important, profoundly important. But we're also believing in a new calling, in a new life. You see, it is not only the receiving of the forgiveness of our sins. It's believing in a new calling. It's abandoning all the efforts that rule over our lives now and over our personal kingdoms. That's what Jesus was proclaiming. As we move into verse 16 and 20, what we see here is not a complete description of the calling of the disciples. You can find that in other, in other parts of the Gospels. And let me pause here for a moment. As I, as I preach through Mark, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a parallel version of the Gospels. And I'm not going to give you a par- I'm not going to tell you everything about everything that's in all the Gospels. Why? Because what we're, our goal is to come back and say, what was the Gospel of Mark? How was it written? And why was it written so simply? Why didn't he give all these details? And we remember that once again, Mark was written to an audience in Italy, probably under Rome, under Nero, under persecution, and he is one who's driving to the key points. So as we look at this text, what we see is Jesus is passing by the Sea of Galilee, and he comes to Simon and Andrew, then later James and John. And then again, he he gives them the same calling. Now, why does, he end, why does he just give these four guys when we know there's eventually going to be 12? Well, it seems to be from the text that automatically what, what Mark is doing is saying, Jesus comes, he gives this message of repentance and faith uh, and believing because the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he goes, and it's almost like he goes, moves, jumps ahead, as Mark does so often, to the calling of these disciples to say, let me show you what this looks like. So right here in the middle of this passage is an illustration of Jesus' calling to repentance and belief. So we recognize that. See, the first readers of Mark, okay, they may have known who Peter was, and that may be why he jumped to Peter. We also recognize that throughout, we look at Scripture, this probably wasn't the first time 
that these men, that these men saw Jesus. It clearly wasn't. You can look in John 1, verse 35. But what we mean is Jesus is saying to them, he's calling them out. And what will their response be? Notice verse 17. He says to Andrew and Simon, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see, Jesus, they have already knew the repentance and belief part, but it's moving on to understanding the call went beyond that repentance, but called the belief to an action. It's an action to the kingdom. This call was to give them a new purpose, a new vision in life. It was a call to follow. It was a training and empowering as Jesus, notice what he said, he would make them fishers of men. Jesus isn't saying, follow me and become, and you're, you're, I've just, you are a fisher of men, now come, do, the st- do what you're supposed to do. Notice what Jesus does. He calls them, asks them to believe in him, and he says, follow me and I will make you. See, even in Jesus' calling, and as, she, as we move through the book, we will see these guys were totally inadequate for the task. Jesus knew that when he called them. But as, you, as they are, again, disciples, followers of Jesus, men who Jesus was discipling, part of the process was him enabling them, training them to become disciples, become fishers of men. And notice, notice again, this is where Mark throws the immediately thing in there. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. We recognize what did the following of Jesus cost them? Notice that it cost them, first of all, their family. Verse 20, they left their father Zebedee in the boat. Obviously, they left, they lost, they walked away from their occupation. And we realize in the sons of Zebedee that a, they also left a profitable business in what is unusual in that day. It was a large enough fishing business that they had hired hands. Look at that in verse 20. So this, this was no small thing. These men (laughs) understood, again, the calling of Christ, and they understood the calling of the kingdom. This is what we have to be careful we don't miss. And you say, Bob, how (laughs) how would you get any idea that they actually had some idea that it was a calling to the kingdom? Well, don't forget, these, though they were fishermen, whether it's through tradition or not, they had an understanding of the Old Testament. That was their scripture. And we recognize that this phrase, fishers of men, it isn't like Jesus is being creative. Let's see. I'm going to go call a few guys. They're fishermen, so I'm going to call them fishers of men, right? The next time he went down and he found some salesmen, we're going to call them sales of Jesus, sailors of Jesus. No, the fishers of men is a profound truth that's rooted in the Old Testament. And for those guys, again, there was a, there was a catch there that they understood the seriousness of this calling. You see, when we pause for a moment, we recognize that throughout the Old Testament, there is a picture where God's attention is focused on something bigger. We realize that, again, what in, in the Old Testament, the prophecies, several of them, one of them in Jeremiah 16, where it pictures God as the one who fishes. Now, as you look at those passages of scriptures and others, you'll realize it's not a pleasant picture of God when it describes God's fishing. It's graphic. It's, it's in many ways uh, sobering because it speaks as a warning to, the, to God's people that they need to change, they need to repent, or God is coming like a fisherman and it is, is coming with a, with a hook and he will snag them and pull them in. See, Jesus hide, didn't hide that fact to the disciples. Because part of the fishers of men, part of as we bring people, we offer salvation to others, is a process of saving them from the judgment of God. It's a picture of God's grace where there's still, as God calls and as people repent and come to faith in Jesus Christ, they fish them, they bring them in from the kingdom of darkness into, into his kingdom of light. They become children of God and they no longer fear the judgment of God. They never fear the ominous hook of God, of, of that picture of his judgment that will come. You see, because Jesus' reign had begun, there was an urgency to the work of those who were to be called fishers of men. Now, I've hinted at it as we've gone through this message, is we need a vision. Every one of us in in this room needs a vision. And I hesitate to say this because if I say we need a vision of fishing, I know some of you automatically are going to go like, oh yeah, I like trout fishing. 
I was thinking about buying a new boat. No. We need a new vision, a vision to God's type of fishing. See, in our life, we have all kinds of projects, don't we? We have a job, and in our jobs, our places of employment, we have, we have tasks. We think about that. Some of you right now may be thinking about your work. We have projects of raising family, serving in the church. Most of us have projects at home. It may be hobbies, other things that we do. You may be remodeling. Some of you have told me, like, yes, I had to, I had to be quarantined for two weeks because of COVID, but I got the bathroom remodeled and a few other things done. There's things that we have. There are projects around ourselves. But I want to tell you, for every project you have, if you would sit down with me, and you may be doing projects in your house, whatever it is, a hobby, you go around. I bet you just about for every one of you, there's unfinished projects. We start them, and we don't get them done. It may be a room that's half painted. It may be something that's half modeled. It may be something that's sewing that you haven't done. I don't know what your project is. For students, it's that project you're supposed to have done, you know, like Monday morning and you haven't, you're only halfway through. I don't know. But there's something I noticed about our endeavors of our lives, including my own, is we often start with a good goal, a real and a valuable and important vision, but when challenges, when difficulties come up, we lose heart. It may be that that room you're trying to paint or that bathroom you're trying to remodel, you did great until you got to the tiles. I don't know. It could be that your goal, your ambition, your New Year's resolution was to do whatever it was, and all of a sudden, oh, you know, my goal is to run so many miles a day. Well, that worked until it got cold, right? There's things that come into our lives. We start them, but all of a sudden we can lose our passion, our vision to do that. And as we look at these passages, and I looked at it this week, I realized that all of us, including myself, we need a vision that will carry us through the rough times, the difficult times, the challenging times, the uncertain times. In fact, we need a vision that's so compelling that we don't want to give it up, a vision that's so compelling that we pass it on to our children, a vision that's so compelling that we recognize that this church will will last. It's a vision that is so compelling that it affects all the people around us. And I want to say to you, that passion, that vision that you can have that's so compelling, that can change the world, that will not fail, is a vision that's rooted in being called to be fishers of men, women, boys, and girls. See, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is a radical commitment, but it's a, it's a powerful commitment. See, that call to follow him, that call to Simon, Andrew, James, and John, is no less significant to us sitting in this room than those men. We have to ask ourselves the question, you know, if Jesus was with us physically and he looked at you and he said, would you, how would you respond? Now, Jesus is not here physically with us, but he is present with us spiritually. And through his word, he's asking a response in our lives. And when I think of the faithfulness going beyond the text, we think of even disciples like Thomas eventually. Amit Iso, if you talk to him and his family history, we realize that his part of India, where he came from, do you know how they were evangelized in the first place? was Thomas. Yes. You see, our call, the vision, the desire to follow Christ, to be fishers of men, is powerful and compelling. God has called every believer to this amazing, exciting, and victorious calling. We recognize as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, His kingdom would come. That's not saying in a future tense, is that his kingdom would continue to grow. His continue, his, we pray that more and more people would come to faith in Jesus Christ. We pray that his will would be done as it is in heaven. That's our desire, and that's what we're called to be part of. So it starts with our own repentance, a repentance of our misguided use of times and talents and treasures, a repentance of our, of our lack of focus, a repentance of our own apathy for the kingdom of God and His calling upon our lives. It means evaluating our priorities. It means spending less time on fish and more time on people. But not only is it repentance, but it's, it's a belief. It means believing in the promises and the call of Jesus to follow Him. 
Please don't let me minimize this. Our call to believe in Jesus Christ as, our Lord, as your Lord and Savior is powerful. It's important. We must believe in Him for the forgiveness of sins. We must believe in Him to overcome the power of sins in our lives. But Jesus just didn't call us in isolation as individuals who can selfishly live our lives. He called us to be part of something bigger. It isn't just His family, it's His kingdom. He called us to a noble calling. And is actually believing that enough that you put it to action. Because, you see, it's not just repent, believe, but it's follow. Join in the glorious plan of salvation, seeing lost people, men, women, and children, saved from the judgment of God. It may cost you greatly in the short term, but I want to tell you the eternal rewards will be enormous. I have been able to live my life around people who've given their life, given everything to follow Jesus. In the end of their life, they have nothing financially. They're not going to be written in any history book. There's no biographies written them. There won't be any list of famous great Christians at all. But they were part of a glorious plan to see God's kingdom advance. But fourthly, repent, believe, follow, but trust. Trust. So again, it's not just trusting in Him for salvation, but it's recognizing that we can't be effective fishers of men unless God graciously enables us to do it. There's no, there's no five easy steps to be an effective fisherman. It's not there. It's a journey of, of faith. It's a journey of trusting Him. It's a journey of each of us recognizing what is my call going to cost me? It may not cost, you may not have to walk away from your job. You may not have to walk away from family. It may not cost you those. But what are you willing to give up? And that's a matter of prayer and see, searching and, and listening to the Holy Spirit. Say, God, how can I serve this kingdom? And what am I hanging on to that I value more than your kingdom? What, what am I willing to give up? You see, without Jesus' strength, His You know, His enabling us, His making us, and His gifting us to do the task, to even die to ourselves. We can't do that until He graciously does it. Because so often, as Jesus called these men to, He called them to a task that they could not do. But He did not leave them in their alone, alone to do it. He trained them and poured out His grace to them and promised His Holy Spirit so that when He left, the Holy Spirit empowered them in powerful ways to do the task that they were called to do. That is still applies to us today. God will empower you, strengthen you, and enable you to do whatever He's called you to do. That's a guarantee. That's a promise of Scripture. So we're left not only with with this response of our call of Jesus to repent, believe, and follow, and trust, but here is the deeper question that affects it all. Profound to your understanding of actually grasping this is coming this as Jesus asks you, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? If you miss that, you will miss everything that's gone before. Is He the Christ? Is He the Messiah? Is He the Lord over all creation? Does He rule and reign over everything as we sit today, regardless of what fears you may face or uncertainties you may be? Is He who He claims to be? And in your hearts, you must ask, who do you say I am? Your response to that simple question will affect every corner of your life. So who do you say he is? Let's pray. Father, I confess in my own heart that I fail to recognize that not only is Jesus my Savior, not only do I have the power of the Holy Spirit to help me through my life, to help me overcome sin, and to enable me to do what I normally cannot do, But Father, I am so reluctant to repent of the idols in my life. I'm so reluctant to believe that you will supply everything I need if I follow your calling. I am so reluctant to trust because I want to try to do it my own way. And so Father, I confess that so often I don't look to you, don't give you my life again, don't give you my things, my name, my reputation, all that I own. 
Because, Father, I know that just as Peter and Andrew, Andrew, James, and John have been called by you, we, every believer in Jesus Christ, has been called to this calling. Grant us grace, we pray, to see and to understand who Jesus is. And may we have such a vision of who he is, such an understanding of who it is, that it changes every one of our lives, changes our families, changes our church, and changes our country. And we pray in Jesus' name.